Benvenuti. Benvenuti a tutti alla... Welcome. Welcome to you all at the first online conference that will open a cheese, this uh, important meeting of uh, uh, cheese makers, uh, um, cheese lovers that uh, will uh, enliven the streets of Bra from tomorrow onwards. And we are very happy we managed to organize it at this very moment. It's a real uh, interesting occasion to get together and discuss and share. And uh, it, it, I think it was a, we were in bad need of meeting and exchanging and sharing. My name is Jacopo Boracci. I have uh, a farm and I've been collaborating for years with Slow Food about certain topics related to animal husbandry. And uh, today I have uh, this tough duty of moderating this meeting, which I hope will inspire you all, considering the level of our speakers and the quality of our speakers. But uh, first of all, I'd like to profit from this uh, occasion to um, just focus our attention on the topic of this uh, um, event, uh, of this uh, seminar, that is to say, consider animals, consider gli animali. When Raffaella called me to, uh, and told me that uh, they wanted to use this claim, consider gli animali, so consider animals, uh, and uh, I thought, uh, well, but uh, what are we referring to when we think of the very notion of consideration? Consideration, what does consideration of animals mean? Um, so what does consider, considering mean? Because this word, which we use very often in Italian, considerare, is a very important uh, source. That is to say, sinus sidera in uh, Latin, which means uh, stars and con is cum. Then it's uh, with stars. Considera is translates from Latin with stars. So it means like the Latins used to do, they considered the stars a bit to understand indications for the future. And therefore, I think that uh, uh, this word is perfect for this uh, moment in time, because if we um, adopt this uh, notion, for animals, it's true that uh, if we truly started to consider truly animals in the very sense of uh, to consider the verb consider, we should focus on them, uh, try to understand them and try to understand their needs uh, and their preferences, and uh, which is something which um, is extremely important. And we should learn from what they tell us, from what they teach us, uh, and then try to shape uh, based on this uh, our relationship of, with them. Why? Well, to try to continue, continue this co-evolution process of um, humans and animals, because this co-evolution, so this relationship that is going on uh, for ages has stopped in the last decades because of these uh, farming, the animal husbandry systems, which are based on conditioning animals, constraining animals, and also but changing the morphology, the shape of animals. Why is it so? Well, because of choices, business choices that, uh, that we make. Um, and uh, so today in front of us, we have a system which is not working um, from the environmental standpoint, social standpoint, economic standpoint. And therefore we have to um, stop and think, rethink what is the notion of animal husbandry uh, in its very core. And, uh, and if we do that, we see that uh, also in Italian allevamento, so animal husbandry means to grow, uh, to make some, some beings grow. And uh, therefore, we should try to reverse this notion, this paradigm, because on the one thing, and we can think that um, man has uh, always uh, tried to domesticate and, and raise animals and control animals and educate animals, but we should now try to do the opposite and try to have them educate us and tell us uh, their needs, their preferences, and so be educated 
created by them because I deeply believe that uh, humans are closely morally linked and connected uh, to animals very, very closely. And uh, humans should be custodians of the well-being of, uh, of animals. So after the short uh, introduction, I'd like to close my introduction and I'd like to thank from the deep in my heart, the speakers who will uh, join us, uh, Professor Fred Provenza, Professor Simone Pollo, Andrea Gallinelli for accepting our invitation to share with us. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Piero Sardo cannot attend because he had uh, suddenly a commitment within the framework of cheese. And so in any case, there will be a chance for a, a Q&A session at the end instead of his presentation. Therefore, I'd like to uh, welcome again Fred Provenza, dear friend who has inspired me a great deal, a professor, Professor Emeritus of Behavioral Ecology at uh, the Wildland Resource Department of the Utah State University in the US. And so I leave the floor to him and uh, for this first round of uh, speeches and uh, you have eight minutes. Thank you very much, Jacopo. What, what a wonderful introduction that you gave to this. and. What I want to do is to begin by talking about the animal part, and then in the last four minutes that I have, talk about the uh, our part of this. And I want to do that by talking about plant diversity, focusing on diversity, and how that creates health for, for the system, including the animals in the system. I'll touch on elements related to animal welfare, climate and environment, and human health as well as I go along here. I want to begin by, by making the point that resource availability in the environment, that is to say sunlight, nutrients, and water, influences plant diversity and chemistry that are in the pastures and landscapes we inhabit. And that in turn is important for the health of herbivores in the sense that you were talking, learning from them and the choices they make. Um, we can think in this sense, plants turn dirt into soil and diverse mixtures of plants turn soil into homes, grocery stores and pharmacies for herbivores, carnivores and omnivores below and above ground. So plant diversity is absolutely essential for health. And from the work that we did over 45 years, I would say nothing's more important for health through nutrition than landscapes that have a variety of different plant species growing on them. Um, and let me start out by, by saying why I see that as the case from the animal standpoint, the animals. And if you think of health, we can think about the ability of animals to maintain their health. And there are actually two ways that animals can self-medicate themselves. One is if they get sick, uh, selecting plants that help to, them to recover, that is therapeutically. The other though, that's not often thought about is prophylactically. Let me touch briefly on each of those. Um, so here's an animal that's sick uh, and uh, from the standpoint of livestock and studies that we did over the years, we begin by asking the question, can animals actually self-medicate? And we were first offering animals high grain diets, which we know cause acidosis and cause malaise, they nauseate animals. And we showed that sheep indeed can learn to self-medicate using either sodium bicarb or bentonite to relieve acidosis. Sheep also learn to avoid foods that cause rumen distension, uh, and they learn to prefer foods eaten during relief from rumen distension. So to put that into <clears throat> common language, one of the plants, alfalfa or lucerne, we know causes bloat. Tannins in plants like bird's foot trefoil alleviate bloat. So animals learn to utilize bird's foot trefoil in combination with alfalfa to alleviate bloat. We know also that sheep and goats can self-medicate with plants high in tannins and terpenes for self internal parasites. Um, parasitized sheep and goats eat less high tannin food when their parasite infection is terminated though with ivermectin, a drug that kills internal parasites. So they know how to do that 
but sometimes we can inhibit their ability to do that through the medications we give them. So there are many, many ways then that animals can learn to self-medicate that we showed, and they learn to use specific foods or compounds for specific states of, of malaise, basically. They can also maintain their health by <clears throat> prophylactically. And we and many people did many studies following cattle, sheep, goats, and wild animals around looking at the diets they select. And what we find is that three to five plants typically make up the bulk of the diet. But during a meal, animals will sample 50 to 75 plants during the day. And we used to focus mainly on the three to five because those are what are <clears throat> we think of as increasing the performance of animals, their production. But I think the 50 to 75 are equally, if not more important through their antimicrobial, antiparasitic, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and immune boosting responses. The phytochemicals um, in these plants bolster health and protect animals against diseases and pathogens. We know from studies that are being done now around the globe that health improves when livestock graze diverse mixtures of plants compared with monocultures. We also know that they're able to gain weight more efficiently with less emissions of greenhouse gases, and they can reach slaughter weight as quickly as animals in feedlots. So diversity is, matters a lot. Here in the United States, livestock producers are finding that morbidity and mortality decrease when stock or cattle forage on diverse mixtures of plants as opposed to monocultures. That's why also plant species, for instance, like Cerecia and tall fescue, which are thought to be not very palatable plants, when they're in mixture, animals can eat large amounts of those. The reason is that tannins in Cerecia negate the adverse effects of alkaloids in tall fescue, and so there creates a complementarity. We studied many of these complementarities over time and found that biologically diverse, biochemically diverse diets enable sequences that complement one another. For instance, an appetizer of trefoil helps animals, cattle and sheep both to eat more endophyte infected tall fescue. The tannins in trefoil bind the alkaloids in fescue, alleviating their aversive effects. The same is true for plants like bitterbrush and sagebrush. People like Glen Elzinga, are using that kind of knowledge here in the Western United States to move animals in sequences across landscapes uh, using techniques that we talked about in this book, The Art and Science of, of Shepherding. And so he creates these grazing systems that allow them to use to create appetizer phases, main courses, dessert stages, booster stages, that stimulate appetite and intake, allow them to utilize all the plants in the community, and they enable individuals to regulate their intake of primary and secondary compounds. They allow individuality. We know that no two individuals are alike in their needs for nutrients and medicines, and self-selection and choice enables individuals then to more <clears throat> efficiently meet needs for nutrients and medicines, as we showed in studies with goats, sheep, and cattle. <clears throat> that is a huge issue with animals in confinement. <clears throat> there is no average animal, and yet <clears throat> feedlot diets are formulated for the average animal. Animals are not given choices. They're allowed to have only one food, which is stressful. High grain diets uh, eaten day after day <clears throat> are, are aversive to animals. They cause diseases, including metabolic syndrome, which we have to treat with, with antibiotics. So all of these then have issues for, for animal welfare. <clears throat> what I'll do then is close with that. And I'll pick up in the second session by talking about the value of that diversity for animals, not only for their health, but for our health as well in terms of quality of milk, cheese, and meat. Grazie mille, Fred. Grazie per 
per questi spunti che... Thank you, Fred, for this uh, food for thought. And uh, thank you. This stimulates me a lot. I mean, uh, you... Um, so that's very important what you said. We should give back animals freedom of choice, which is impossible with the unifeed rations and the uh, also conditioning the climate uh, in the farms. Uh, this not, does not allow to give them freedom of choice. On the contrary, freedom of choice, well managed, can certainly be beneficial for animals, but for the management also the entire ecosystem. Um, because and the animal can be, for instance, a symbol of a specific landscape. That, and then this can have, uh, for instance, uh, touristic implications and uh, this I mean, this is uh, uh, extremely important. It's important for animals to be able to reconquer, so conquer again the places where they live. In any case, now I'd like to leave the floor to Professor Simone Pollo, whom I met uh, eight, um, years ago in uh, a conference on animal ethics. And I'm very fond in, in, of uh, what he says um, about animals. He teaches moral philosophy at the University Sapienza of Rome. And so now I would like to leave the floor to him. Thank you. Thank you, Jacopo, and uh, thanks to Slow Food and the entire organization. It's a great pleasure to be here. I apologize, I don't have slides, but you know, philosophers are this way. We just speak off the cuff and uh, we don't use the slides. Um, I would like to start from the title of uh, this uh, um, conference, so Considera gli animali, Considerare gli animali, so consider animals, uh, which uh, Jacopo described um, and uh, explained. And I'd like to say something uh, just very broadly and uh, in general about uh, um, what uh, um, ooh, philosophy and philosophers can do um, and uh, by paying attention to uh, the importance of relationships between humans and animals. Um, and it's very important to understand the interactions between humans and animals. And it, it's very interesting to investigate these interactions. And I would like to say immediately, sorry for being very schematic, but I would like to say that um, considering the relationships between uh, humans and animals uh, um, in in all the interactions we have uh, with, uh, with animals, so all relations included between uh, animals and uh, um, humans. Um, so these uh, investigations should, sorry, this uh, relationship should be investigated so as to be able to change them. Of course, in our contemporary society, so in these countries where we live, of course, I'm not talking about Afghanistan or Afghanistan or other countries where there are other problems, but uh, in the world where we live, we are here on Zoom and shared all together from our countries. So the fact of considering our relationships uh, uh, with humans as uh, something which is not obvious is um, very specific to our uh, civilization. What do I mean by this? I mean that uh, when we think of the way we use or not use animals in uh, for animal husbandry, for food production. So we kind of challenge uh, traditions and practices which are centuries old practices and traditions which we have inherited from our parents, from our grandparents, from our civil civilization. And why do we do that? And uh, often we do in ways that such that we in the end are divided. So something that um, it's no problem to use animals for food production, others say it's a problem. Um, others say it's a problem, but we can keep doing that. And so uh, we can select uh, the animals uh, 
for food production. So why do we do this? Well, because at a certain point, and unfortunately I have to be very schematic, in our civilization, European civilization at least, or Western civilization, a couple of things happened. For instance, in the 1800, so 1900, philosophers and the society as a whole start to see that the, the suffering uh, uh, of uh, having um, feelings and suffering and pain is something that should attract our moral consideration. And therefore, a great uh, European philosopher um, um, in, said, when uh, uh, we consider what we should do with animals, we should not uh, wonder whether they can speak or, um, or do this or that, but we should wonder if they can suffer. And actually, there's something that is morally relevant in animals. So their feelings, so the centrality of their feelings is a fact that characterizes our civilization and the way we make it progress. Then after Bentham, the British philosopher, we have another big revolution that is the Darwin revolution, because this scientist Darwin told us that we human beings are not different ontologically from other animals, but we are all in a line of continuity. And so those suffering and feelings that animals have are um, uh, the same as our feelings and our sufferings. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, the feelings we have for our friends, our children, etc. Um, of course, uh, the evolution is different. Our genetics are different, but the feelings are the same. And uh, therefore, these two facts, uh, these two events in our modern age led to what? Well, they led to the fact that we today, at least some of us, but this is something we cannot ignore, we believe today that the moods, the feelings, the suffering, pleasures, pain of animals, so how animals feel, which today we put under the umbrella of animal welfare. So how animals feel is something that uh, is relevant to us uh, and relevant to our idea of being civilized or not being civilized uh, that is related to, to the moral status of our societies and so animals are no longer just tools or objects uh, and uh, this is also um, and also the european union in uh, its uh, fundamental uh, treaty, so the, let's say, let's call it the European Constitution, the Lisbon Treaty, states that uh, uh, animals deserve attention for their well-being and welfare. And of course, uh, the European um, Union is not recognizing or acknowledging rights to animals, but uh, the European Union says uh, something extremely important because it acknowledges that the very fact that animals are living beings, they have rights. And so today we are in a situation which is, so to speak, intermediate. Um, so a sort of uh, blurred situation uh, with uh, a lot of developments and uncertainties. So now we have acknowledged that animals are no longer objects and uh, therefore we, um, so because of uh, what I have just said, uh, so that animals and uh, feel, uh, sorry, feelings of animals matter and they are similar to ours. So they are not separated. So because we human beings are animals, and this is what Darwin taught us, but in spite of this, we are still at a time when we have a lot of traditions and lifestyles in which animals are used like objects. But there is a reflection to make that is growing, at, uh, gaining attention, which is the challenge that we have today about the way we treat animals. So what I'm saying in closing, um, it, it, what is important is not uh, so much important to understand whether we should be vegan, vegetarian, even though that's important too. But the true challenge to consider animals is to think about them and reflect on them. 
ponder of them and not give for granted any tradition or any use of animals that we have inherited from our tradition. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Thank you for two reasons, for your words and uh, for uh, having um, respected the time you had. Yes, uh, you make me remind, uh, you, you remind me of um, uh, something that they say in the US, it's, it's not the cow, but it's the how. So it's how we do things, uh, not what we do, but how we do it. So with what thought process, so with what uh, thinking process um, is behind what we do. And this is very relevant, I believe, in the assessment and in the choices that we can make. And now I would like to conclude this first round by giving the floor to Andrea Gavinelli, who is the uh, responsible for the um, uh, animal uh, welfare uh, unit at the European Commission, uh, because the, uh, what the European Commission decides is very important because this has a significant impact on the animals, on the farmers, and the, um, et cetera. So, you have eight minutes. Well, eight minutes uh, are, oh, well, that's challenging to stick to eight minutes. <laughs> but uh, let's say that we are, we have come at a, funda um, that, that's a fundamental moment in time. So I'm responsible for a unit that is in charge of animal well being and animal welfare. And I've been here for 20 years here to, to lead the perhaps the most important platform at the global level, most important platform for the management of standards and rules and regulations, which um, within the framework of the common agricultural policy um, rule are about uh, animal well-beings. Because already 20 years ago, um, we um, decided that we had to have rules and regulations for uh, animal welfare uh, with um, within the framework of a, a public and democratic approach. 20 years back, uh, we, did, we had no idea of uh, where this journey would take us to. We started off with a journey. So I, initially the idea was to uh, improve the situation of uh, egg lying eggs in uh, uh, farms. And there was a discussion among a few countries. Um, of, um, and, and those discussions were very new 20 years ago uh, about this. And this is pretty fascinating. Um, so for instance, uh, um, we started working on what was suffering. That was the question. And it was fun to read in the reports um, and it was uh, interesting because uh, the ministers at that time were discussing about uh, um, useful suffering and uh, useless suffering uh, for animals to be slaughtered. That's pretty um, strange to hear that now. Uh, of course, a lot of things have happened in the meantime. Now, today, I'm sure you heard about the Green Deal and the farm to fork strategy of the EU. Well, that's an important document because the European Union is now establishing rules for related to the notion of, I mean, developing a sustainable food supply chain. And this is related also to organic farming, there are many investments uh, foreseen. And one of the topics, one of the areas is animal welfare. And uh, the goals that uh, we have within the framework of the farm to fork strategy are goals which uh, blend, which integrate animal uh, welfare, animal health, and at the same time, the um, re, uh, less use of medications. Uh, so reduction in the use of medication, that's important uh, to underline because these policies uh, might sound obvious uh, to many of you and um, 
at least to the speakers who are here, but uh, if we consider the uh, revision of the rules uh, of the laws that govern the, the entire system, I'm talking about billions of animals raised in the EU, is actually something revolutionary instead. So the first goal for the people who do my job is to see whether the four or five uh, regulations or um, around animal welfare are suitable and appropriate for the ambitions and the objectives that we were given by the parliament and the citizens within this farm to fork strategy. And this is a process which is in progress. And of course, the first thing that we have realized is that uh, so we have uh, legislations about uh, animal husbandry, transport of animals, prevention of suffering, animal welfare at the moment of uh, slaughtering, but uh, um, the scientific um, foundations so this, um, uh, are already obsolete. Um, therefore, we need to have, first of all, a scientific revision of the models that we have been using uh, some 15 or 20 years ago for our directives. And therefore we requested uh, to the European Food Safety um, Agency in Parma to give us reports, to prepare reports about the scientific pro progress in this field. But on the other side, there is also um, it's also important to assess the environmental impact of animal husbandry activities. And this also involves the notion of density, animal density in uh, um, animal farms. And actually the commission received a few months ago, a petition signed by over 1 million European citizens who asked uh, for the abolition of cages. And uh, so the European uh, citizens motivated this for uh, with various uh, um, considerations and the um, European Commission decided uh, to commit to that. So that's a very important decision. And uh, so the commission acknowledged that this request, this petition, and committed to abolish cages for some animals, types, some types of animals. And um, it will take, of course, time to understand the impact um, that uh, this will have also on the um, economic activities related to animal husbandry and animal farms. And uh, um, this is uh, an analysis that would be conducted over the next two years. And the goal is to make proposals to the commission that will be presented in 2023. So discussing here today with you at Cheese is so important because so it's important to talk about moral and ethical and also uh, technical aspects with um, animal farmers because these are epoch making moments um, in, uh, in the um, European Union, because this re reformation, this reform is happening now, and uh, we'll have to stipulate and create together um, a roadmap for the next uh, 20 years, because we cannot invest um, uh, to, um, so we have a platform with 27 countries and this requires huge uh, investments. And these investments must be based on this shift that uh, will lead to changes and bring to evolutions in this respect. Unfortunately, the eight minutes are almost over, but uh, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, uh, what, what, by telling you the guiding principles that we would like to follow. The first is to open the scope of uh, the current regulation, because so far we only focused on some animal species, but uh, for instance, now we are a cheese, but for instance, we don't have requirements, specific requirements for milk producing cows in particular, who, who have very uh, specific needs in terms of well-being. So we have to enlarge, extend the scope. Then the second goal is to create a legislation which is easy to apply, that is clear, transparent, and that can then be so 
there are 27 countries and that can be implemented in all the countries as fast as possible so as to avoid uh, the welfare problems that we keep encountering. Then the third principle is a principle um, uh, of flexibility because today we have a legislation that once it's written it's carved in stone on our official gazette and doesn't evolve uh, with the scientific progress and the needs of the society that keep growing and evolving day in day out so we will need tools uh, that will maybe give more delegated powers um, so as to uh, be able to implement um, updates of the legislation faster than uh, than what it has been so far and then last um that was also part of the the the, the overall strategy is how uh, we can relate to the so-called rest of the world, because actually the rest of the world, so the other countries, in terms of uh, standards uh, in for animal well-being, uh, is not going as fast as the um, European Union. There are only a few cases, a few countries uh, uh, that uh, are doing more, such as New Zealand, for instance. But uh, actually, we would have to understand um, also for competitiveness uh, uh, reasons, but also for ethical reasons, what to do with what the European Union is importing. And I'm saying this also to people like uh, Jacob, also animal farmers uh, can face tough competition, but what matters first and foremost is to give an ethical um, solution for European citizens. I have talked about various topics. I hope uh, I will add uh, something else later on and continue over the years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. The, the challenge uh, um, in Europe is quite significant. And uh, um, I have seen the projects uh, um, that uh, also the individual farms uh, can implement and develop to uh, manage uh, animals uh, uh, in a much, much better way. So also um, the animal farms uh, can do, can contribute, I mean, and uh, this is what we are all trying to do. We think this is the right direction, not only for us, uh, but also for the management of our territories uh, so, so just to um, put back together the environment and the animals like fred said at the beginning of his presentation because we start from the health of the soil and then we end up with the um, health of the pastures of the grazing of the fields health of uh, animals health of humans and so these are great challenges uh, definitely that uh, need to be combined all together and approached um, also um, in the uh, so in the legislature in the objectives of the legislature so thank you very much you've been great and managing your eight minutes and i hope you will be also for your next eight minutes so and now i leave the floor back to fred provenza for the his uh, second contribution and um, so and, uh, therefore he already told us that uh, he will uh, um, talk uh, he will talk about the link between uh, the diet of animals um, and the diet of uh, humans and the, the repercussions the implications from many standpoints you have the floor fred okay thank you very much jacopo and uh so in the first part of the presentation what i was trying to make the case is that plant diversity and chemistry enable animals to select diets and that becomes a welfare issue for the animals for their health and well-being their choice and ability to choose becomes very important for their health well-being and welfare um, but what i want to say in this second part relates to us so the animals and then to us is that plant diversity and chemistry influences the biochemical richness of the diets of animals which in turn influences the quality of meat, milk, and cheese that, that we ingest. Many years ago, and I chose this de deliberately because it was a study that was done in Italy, what they did was to work with dairy cows and they offered dairy cows either a choice of grazing botanically diverse swards, plant communities, 
or they fed them a total mixed ration of grains and forages. And then what they did was to look at the flavor and the phytochemical and biochemical richness of the milk and cheese. And they showed that when animals were allowed to forage on diverse pastures, the flavor was much better, as was the phytochemical and biochemical characteristics of, of the, the cheese. And they, the local peoples very much preferred the flavors of milk and cheese from dairy cows grazing on the botanically diverse swords as opposed to the total mixed ration. So that's linking then diversity with, with, um, with health and then with our health. The, the same is true for meat. The flavor of meat is influenced by the phytochemical richness of the diet of animals. But when you look in the scientific literature, there hasn't been a great deal of study to try to understand how does the diversity of the diet influence these flavor, quality, um, the ability of that to, to meet health for humans. There's one study I know of that was very important that was done in Australia years ago. And what they showed was that <clears throat> at following a meal, the inflammatory response in the body of people who are eating meat was much lower when they ate meat from kangaroos foraging on diverse pastures as opposed to cattle that were foraging in feedlots. Um, they didn't follow up on studies with cattle on diverse pastures versus cattle in feedlots. I'll say more about that in just a minute. But why inflammatory response? We know that low-grade systemic inflammation leads to a variety of diseases in human beings. Notably, inflammation occurs anytime we eat a meal, there's an inflammatory response in our body. Um, the kind of foods we eat influence that response. And if we eat pro-inflammatory foods repeatedly, then we increase the likelihood of various diseases. Um, so some foods are known to be pro-inflammatory, um, including red meat and fat it is, is known as pro-inflammatory. Herbs and spices, vegetables and fruits, and wholesome foods are known to be anti-inflammatory. We know that phytochemically rich herbs and spices are anti-inflammatory. Uh, here in the United States, we know that Native Americans used to add herbs and spices to foods to enhance palatability, satiation, and satiety. And we know that they reduce the alleged adverse effects of eating, eating meats. Um, there was a study recently came out in Morocco that showed that eating traditionally processed meats was not associated with increased risks of colon cancer, which is what people are always talking about related to meat. Um, and the reason they argue is that they cure that meat with olive oil, herbs, spices, such as cumin, garlic, coriander, salt, and vegetables. So they're making the case about the, these, these herbs and spices reducing inflammatory responses. The last point I want to make is that we have a major project going internationally nowadays where we are comparing um, meat from animals in feedlots versus meat from animals eating phytochemically rich diets. And we're doing metabolomic analyses to look at the phytochemical and biochemical richness of the meat. We're doing feeding trials to compare inflammatory responses in people. And we're doing longer term clinical trials all with the idea then of trying to look at how the linkages between plant diversity and chemistry influence not only the health of livestock, but the health of human beings as well. Thank you, Jacopo. Grazie mille, Fred. Siete veramente super diligenti. Many thanks, uh, Fred. Thank you for being very rigorous with your time. You make my life very easy. Now I would like to leave the floor back to Professor Pollo, um, perhaps to discuss uh, something that uh, um, a very thorny uh, question, um, that is to say this sort of rivalry uh, between animals and uh, humans uh, um, that uh, is uh, also based on the competition for food and then uh, uh, 
also in relation to reproduction and um, for instance uh, today for certain uh, for certain animals um, um, so animals uh, are reproduced uh, artificially and uh, for instance uh, there are uh, in some herds there are no males uh, and also in for instance in uh, milking uh, in milk farms uh, uh, the um, the cows uh, uh, remain in contact with their offspring so only for a couple of days. So how can we approach uh, this kind of so-called rivalry? Uh, and are there ways uh, to, I'm not just saying technically, but philosophically, to approach uh, this very, very uh, tough uh, topic? Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, well, uh, let me specify something. I wouldn't talk about a rivalita, a rivalry, because actually the animals we have in our farms are not our competitors. They are not our rivals. We use them. And uh, from a certain point onwards in our evolution, we have started to domesticate them for thousands of reasons that have nothing to do with the, the um, with the idea that uh, once uh, uh, a human said, "Well, let me domesticate that uh, uh, cow and use it for my uh, food consumption." In any case, um, the animals are is something we use, uh, and we we use them as if it's uh, just something that's available and when we use them. And so in this respect, uh, we have to be very straightforward uh, also in saying that uh, animals and humans uh, um, have been together. So animals have been part of our life for centuries. Um, and so Having said that animals are part of our life, uh, of a life that we inherit, and we are just a part of our life, so we are omnivores. So we were always put uh, a steak on, in the plate and the water in the glass. And if we've decided to become a vegetarian, it's because we went through a certain thought process, moving away from traditions that we inherited. So given this and given the large amount of animals we use, what is the best strategy to improve and make our relationships with animals improve? Here in the chat, I see many comments, also some angry ones, but actually I'm also happy to read angry comments because so it's always good to criticize if it's proactive and uh, constructive. Uh, I personally don't believe that a certain attitude uh, that is just uh, uh, considering the use of animals as an absolute crime is not an attitude that can improve animal welfare or the conditions of animals or less use of um, animals. Because uh, if I could uh, um, decide about the future of uh, the relationship between humans and animals, I would go definitely for a relationship whereby humans don't use any more uh, animals. But today, it's a 2021, we are in Europe, we are in Italy. I think that objective is not very feasible. So what should we do? Should we continue and try to be radical and say that whoever eats a steak or milk is a uh, assassin, um, criminal, and uh, those who produce milk and meat are killers, criminals, or should we think that, yes, of course, uh, these productions are morally uh, problematic, but uh, these moral problems should be approached with a realistic uh, attitude, which doesn't mean not to accept the situation as it is, but uh, acknowledging that animals are so much part of our life that if we want to change the way we interact with them for them, for their well-being, and since they are uh, not object and uh, they are living beings, so perhaps the best attitude is to work from the inside and talk to those who use animals and consume, eat animals. This not, is not 
perhaps going to be the utopia uh, realized, materialized. But uh, this applies not only for animals, but probably for every morally problematic question we need to tackle. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Uh, thank you. I apologize for saying uh, rivalizza, rivalry, but uh, you corrected me very well. Thank you. Now I would like to move over uh, with uh, Andrea Gavinelli, and I would like to invite him to uh, talk about uh, the labels, labeling for uh, animal welfare on animal products. That's a very deeply felt uh, aspect and um, so there are also some private labels for animal welfare and uh, so what is the uh, European uh, Union um, doing uh, for this for these labels so, and um, do you already have some guidelines to make something uh, efficient and effective for for animal welfare labels thank you thank you um, Jacopo well, as to labels, um, labels uh, are um, certainly resulting from the fact that in the EU, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, 18 new labels were implemented in the last 10, 10 years. But there are, and they also involve animal welfare. And uh, there are some labels that are the result of the work of um, animal farmers and also um, animal protection organizations, consumers, citizens, etc. So the goal uh, we, ha we have is to favor uh, consumers and to competitiveness of uh, producers with higher well animal welfare standards and um, also um, taking into account the importation from third countries. The European Union is a platform which, as you know, has uh, um, the goal of uh, implementing um, principles of the treaty, principle of uh, free exchange, so free trade principles, and so ensure a balance in terms of competitiveness and market transparency. So this is the reason why we are studying the possibility because uh, this is very important, the possibility of harmonizing uh, all these labels uh, across Europe so as to uh, clarify and for the, cons for the sake of consumers what each label mean, what they refer to, and uh, what are the levels of animal well-being uh, that can be achieved in the framework of these standards. We have uh, only one type of uh, labeling referred to the production method. It's for eggs, for eggs. And uh, this is something that has brought about a significant change in uh, the um, eating habits. Because you know, with the that simple little number uh, on the uh, eggshell, uh, we increased by 80% in a matter of few years, the consumption of a free range hen um, eggs. So hens who live outside cages. And this enabled also supermarkets to differentiate their eggs. And that, that, that has been a very positive experience. The, the, the idea is that as far as products are concerned, other products, especially compounded processed products, um, it's uh, so complex that it could have uh, um, the sort of opposite effect for those who invest in the animal welfare, because these certifications sometimes are so expensive that uh, farmers uh, get discouraged. And so that's why it's fundamental. So in our study is not only seen from the social standpoint, but also from the economic standpoint, because we need to invest um, um, efficiently and not uh, have a negative impact on farms. And then the other aspect um, that I would like to underline is that uh, so we, we try to fail, we will try to favor at least the so-called the short supply chain. Short supply chain means that uh, 
producers and consumers are as close as possible. And that's fundamental for sustainability. And in between, there is a challenge, that is to say, to change the paradigm of the retail and distribution uh, chain uh, chains in Europe, which is a paradigm that needs to be to shift because it has proven to be very vulnerable, especially due to the pandemics. And in fact, more robust systems, um, when the pandemic hit, um, um, turned out to be much more sustainable. And uh, we realized that the so-called short uh, supply chains have uh, uh, responded much better. Uh, to the pandemic. We haven't decided yet what roadmap to undertake, but certainly transparency and trying to harmonize all these uh, uh, labels and uh, their databases and IT system is going to be a, a priority. Thank you, Andrea, thank you. So we are uh, almost uh, at the at the end. I'm sorry, I've forced you to summarize maybe even too much what you intended to say. But uh, I would like to conclude by asking a question to Fred. Uh, well, you know me, so a provocation. And uh, please answer to my provocative question. You have just two minutes to answer, though. <laughs> so it's a provocative question, and you have just two minutes, uh, if possible. This is my question. But is it possible for you to have an agriculture which is sustainable without animals? What do you think of ag a sustainable agriculture without animals? Thank you. I don't think that it is possible. I think that animals are absolutely essential for ecological systems. I think their recycling of urine and feces as a part of maintaining healthy soils is so important as a part of creating health of the soil, plant diversity, animal health, and, uh, and then ultimately the health of we human beings as well. So I think animals are, are essential in terms of, of agriculture. I would add one other thought. I think <clears throat> I, I couldn't understand all of the comments. I would like to have read, read all of them to understand. I think though the a key point that strikes me related to plants is that plants are sentient beings as well. They have at least 20 different senses they, they are as, as sentient as animals are. And I think a key point, whether it's animals in the agriculture, plants, the integration, is to realize that all life is sacred. We're members of nature's communities. What we do to them, we ultimately do to ourselves. And only by, by declaring love on them and respect, I think to, will, we in, will we get to sustainability that you're talking about, to realize that all life is sacred, I think is, is critical and that animals are absolutely essential as part of agriculture. Grazie mille, grazie Federo. Thank you, Fred. I knew you could give a very great final remark. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Fred, to Simone, to Andrea for sharing uh, your, uh, your thoughts and your competence and your passion around this topic, uh, which is very much debated and also tough. Uh, but uh, um, uh, I uh, hope I will have a chance to see you in Bra, uh, also to have a chat together as soon as possible. And uh, so I wish you all the best for your nice evening. Have a nice evening and uh, see you again soon. Thank you very much, Jacopo. And thank to the other speakers as well. Be nice to meet yes. you in person sometime. I wish I could. I hope I, that I can. <laughs> thank you, Fred. It was really wonderful. Thank you very much. Same for, for you as well. <clears throat>